Uh, let's start the next talk. Uh, next talk is uh, by Shivan uh, about arbitrarily connected to local random circuits from unitary designs. So please start. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk here. Um, today, I'll talk about what are random circuits and what is this property of, un of theirs called unitary designs and how deep do the circuits need to be to get to those properties. Right. So, you know. ah, okay. <laughs> All right. So, just to clarify some definitions, because people call many things random circuits, and it is going to be important to interpret the new results that have come out in the past eight months or so. Uh, that what I'm going to be calling a random local circuit is you'll have n qubits uh, and you have two qubit gates or n qubits and um, two qubit gates. And there's something called the architecture, which is the connectivity of these qubits. So which two qubits can have a gate acting on them. And then what is going to be the local random circuit is I'm going to pick two qubits which are connected and then apply a random two qubit gate. So for example, the Google's uh, processor is like a 2D architecture and the one by USDC is also a 2D architecture. Just a concrete example in a 1D architecture has nearest neighbor gates, uh, which are picked from the hard measure on uh, U, Q square, where Q is the local language. Um, right, so why are we interested in these things? Uh, of the many reasons, I'm going to focus on three. Uh, first is they act as, so I'm also from the physics department. I understand this is more like a computer science conference. So I have some more physics sort of applications in mind. But uh, random circuits act as models uh, to describe how systems not in equilibrium reach equilibrium. And we can, the, these are analytically tractable models. So we can track how the entanglement changes uh, in, in, in many body systems as the system approaches equilibrium. They also, um, random circuits also are examples of, uh, well, they, they are the models for quantum advantage uh, because of the random circuit sampling task. Uh, and then the third application is sort of originated in high energy physics called complexity growth. I do not know the high energy implications of these things, but the basic idea is, and it works for any quantum many body system. The basic idea is there are quantities like complexity, which continue to grow for time scales much longer than the time scales at which normal quantities like correlation functions would saturate. So it's something that tracks your system beyond what normal thermodynamics quantity can. So uh, random circuits are a case where we can actually prove that the complexity grows. So yes, yeah, a neat example of that. Um, oh. right. So now what's unitary designs? So the, the way I'm gonna describe this is through a random walk picture. So imagine the random quantum circuit is a random walk on the unitary group. So we begin on the identity element in the unitary group and then with every gate that we apply in our circuit, like moving a step randomly on this group. And after T steps or so, we reach some final point. Right? This is one instance of a walk. So if we take many instances of such walks, T step walks, we end up in different locations and this is the distribution over the final points that we get. The question of unitary designs is how close is this distribution to, uh, to the uniform distribution on this group? The uniform distribution is the hard measure. Right. So why would you like to study the closeness of this distribution to the hard measure? Again, so taking those examples that we just discussed, uh, for many body systems, many body quantum systems, we can get the time scales after which those correlation functions or, or some property of entanglement saturates. Right. So if our, if our circuits have this property of unitary designs, uh, and we understand the time scales or the circuit depth after we get this property, then we know the time scales after which our correlation functions session. Um, in quantum advantage experiments, we can derive a property from unitary designs, which is called anti-concentration. And anti-concentration says the output distribution is neither too peaked nor too flat. It's somewhere in the middle, some sweet spot that makes it hard to sample from. 
Um, and then again, uh, if we can show that our random circuits form designs, then we can rigorously prove that the complexity grows. And this was achieved fairly recently, uh, I think in the past four or five months or so, which made my task of making these slides harder and harder. All right, so just more concretely now, what is unitary designs? I think uh, the previous talk hinted at some distinguishability measure. I just want to make this a bit more precise. Um, we are comparing two distributions, one that we get from the circuit and one which is the higher measure. If you want to compare two distributions, the natural thing to do is you compare their moments. Uh, so in this case, if this seems very cryptic to you, all this is saying is compute the kth moment of my distribution and compare it to the kth moment of the higher distribution on the unitary group. And the norm that we pick, well, there's some uh, ambiguity in that. So there are many norms that we can pick to compare these moments. Right now I've written it out as a channel uh, I've written the kth moment as a channel, and that's why I use a channel now. Um, yeah, just to remind you, this was the distribution that we are comparing to the uniform distribution. But there are other norms that one can use, or other notions of distinguishability that one can use. And one, one of those is called a relative error. So this is called an additive error. Epsilon here is called an additive error, whereas this, where phi is just this channel, uh, this sort of an epsilon is called a relative error. Um, so normally, this epsilon or this sort of an error is stronger than uh, this sort of an additive error. But if we demand that the additive error is exponentially small, then that is stronger than the relative error. Right, so th there are these little bit of intricacies in how you define designs. And it's kind of important when you're reading design papers to really understand what is the notion of distinguishability. Yeah. So just to clarify, we, since both of those measures are really hard to directly compute, we never really directly compute them. What we work with is simpler notion of distinguishability. We vectorize our channels, and then we demand an exponentially small operator norm. So that is the operational definition of designs that I'll be working with, and I'll be showing what is this T? How, how large does this T need to be? Uh, given some architecture, what, is, what should this T be such that we get an exponentially small operator on there? Any questions about the definition? Right. So why, why, why do we worry about these? arbitrary architectures. Brandau, Harrow, and Horodeki already proved all of this for 1D architecture. Like, wh why do we care about arbitrary architectures? It's like a simple intuition that if you have more connectivity, you expect uh, that you, perhaps your output distributions of your random circuits become some mess very quickly, as opposed to if you had less connectivity, you will probably expect more gates in your circuit before you get to something which is hard to sample from. So since quantum technologies are becoming more and more powerful that allow for non-local gates, I mean, it would be nice if we had some rigorous results about how quickly, or what's the, what's the connection between connectivity and how quickly we reach hard to sample from distributions or how quickly do we form designs. So before, we started working on these things. Uh, this was the state of the art. Uh, this is not the state of the art, just to clarify, many things have changed over the past eight months, uh, which I'll clarify in the end. Uh, but this was before October, 2023. This was the state of the art, where uh, the way to interpret this is a 1D local architecture just means one gate per time step. Parallel is when you squeeze many gates into the same layer. So really the circuit length is the circuit depth. Um, complete graph is all to all connectivity. And right now you should just completely object and you should be like, okay, the best known result previously was that even on a completely connected geometry, it takes us more gates than it takes us on a 1D geometry. So clearly our results are not optimal. We need to do something better. Uh, in the end, this uh, uh, spoiler, that is still not solved. Right? Even though all the papers that you have seen, that, that distinction between completely connected geometries and 1D geometries are still not solved. 
Uh, and then the last is the dimensional Euclidean lattices. So just lattices. And it's not really a random quantum circuit in the sense that I defined it, but it's sort of close. I just put it up there. These were the geometries for which we knew how to form. Uh, we had rigorous bounds on the depths of circuits after which they form K designs. So what we did was we tried to generalize this to random connected graphs. Right? So if your graphs had some maximum degree less than 38, um, uh, those come out from some numerical calculations. But yes, if you are, if you have some arbitrarily connected graphs with certain maximum degrees, and if you want to form certain order of designs, then we had explicit constants about circuit length. Right? And our method sort of improved upon the 100 page proof of this previous result and made it into two pages. So that was also kind of nice. Um, and then we also identified a class of connected graphs where we can also comment about the scaling in K to form K designs. Um, so, uh, right, so connected graphs with some bounded degree or certain logarithmic depth, they all form um, uh, K designs in polynomial in n number of gates. And the K, uh, the, the, the scaling in K just comes directly from the uh, scaling in K for the 1D bounds. Right, so there were these two methods that we use. One's called the Kanabe method and the other is called the detectability lemma method. Actually, how much time do I have? Okay. So, since I have enough time, I would go over some basic technique of how we went about proving these things. Uh, just a big picture overview. So we want to find the error between the, the kth moments that I call the gap. And we want to find that uh, between the, the distribution that we have after t steps and the uniform distribution. But convolving distributions is hard. So it would be great if you could just work with uh, distributions that we get after one step of the circuit which is what we can do. Uh, it's simple norm inequalities that lets you do that. And then, uh, which is given the first point. And then if we show that this uh, distance is less exponentially small, then uh, we can infer what, what the T should be for uh, the circuit. Depth. The way we do this is using some physics techniques of uh, proving spectral gap lower bounds for Hamiltonians, local Hamiltonians, frustration-free local Hamiltonians. Uh, turns out this object that you see here inside the norm can be interpreted as a uh, Hermitian, it is a Hermitian matrix and it is a Hermitian matrix, which is a sum of many terms, each of which is a little Hermitian matrix, right? Um, and so we can think of it in, in the physics literature that just goes by the name of uh, lo two, local Hamilton uh, two local Hamiltonian, the fact that it's frustration free is a bit more technical, but yeah, it's, it's a nice property that allows you to show what its, uh, uh, what, what's its eigenvalues are, which is what we will be interested in. So the delta H is the second smallest eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian. Uh, and we use some physics tools to prove a lower bound on the spectral gap, delta H, and this depth then is bounded by this simple expression where E is the number of edges in your graph. So if you could find a lower bound on this quantity, then you have an upper bound on the depth after which you get T designs. Um, so we had two methods in mind uh, to prove these lower bounds on the spectral gaps of frustration-free Hamiltonians. Uh, the first method gives us uh, these bounds for a fixed choice of K. And the second method gives us the scaling in K. Um, so I can go over the technical details, uh, but maybe I should just probably give a big picture overview of what's happening in these details, uh, in, in, in these methods. Uh, and the basic idea is to prove spectral gap lower bounds, you want to simplify the graph that you're working with. So instead of the connected graph, just take the spanning tree of the graph. And the Hamiltonian on the, the spectral gap for the Hamiltonian on the spanning tree just lower bounds the spectral gap that you are looking for. 
So operationally, we find this. And to do that, we use this very well-known technique of detect using detectability lemma and quantum union bonds. The way one should think about this is these are the anal matrix analogs of uh, AMGM inequalities in usual algebra, where the spectral gap is like the arithmetic mean and the detectability lemma, the right-hand side of that equation is like a geometric mean. It's a product of many terms that appear in your Hamiltonian. The point, so first you reduce your graph to just the spanning tree, and then using this trick of conjugating your product with permutation operators, you can convert the product into a product that would correspond to a 1D graph. So it's, it's, it's kind of technical, uh, but the point really is that using this sort of AMGM inequality, but for matrices and using a nice trick with permutation operators, you can relate any spanning tree to a 1D graph and then use the known results for the 1D graph in place of uh, for, for, for your results to get upper bound on uh, the circuit depths. The other method is kind of easier to explain. You have a Hamiltonian, you square the Hamiltonian, you get some bad anti-commutator terms, you want to get rid of those. So what you do is uh, you define a new operator, you call it A, which is just sort of the Hamiltonian on a few, uh, uh, few sites. Uh, coming out of a vertex. And then you just rewrite the bad terms in terms of the new operator squared and the old Hamiltonian H. And just basic algebra gives you uh, a lower bound on the spectral gap. Uh, yeah. But for this method to work, you need to find numerically what is the spectral gap of a Hamiltonian on a graph that looks just like the one colored in red. Once you do that, yeah the bounds come straight through. So these are techniques in, in the physics literature that we use. But this year, many things happened. And this is probably the most important sort of uh, uh, message that I would like to uh, give out to everyone. Uh, is I've compiled the results that, have, uh, that came out this past year. Um, and as you can see, there are quite a few. Uh, and these are the ones that directly relate to what we were doing. So look, let, me, let me just quickly walk you through this. So we have a 1D normal architecture and brickwork or parallel just means that you can put many gates in the same layer. That was, uh, that was improved to, the improvement came in the scale dependence, which became linear from what was previously K to the five. Um, then there are other variants of this uh, which are not really the random circuits in the sense that I define them to be. And there you can get logarithmic in end dependence. Uh, so those are really not random circuits in the sense I define them to be. Like those are contrived examples where, yes, you, can, you apply random gates in a very specific manner, and that allows you to get this logarithmic in end dependence. Um, the complete graph... Uh, architecture had only a minor improvement. Well, the improvement came in the k-dependence again and got rid of a log n factor, but uh, that's the best we still know. And the d-dimensional lattices had similar improvements, but from the results, from, from our results, we had for arbitrary connected graphs, we need n to the log n. Uh, we had an n to the log n dependence, but that was improved to n to the airs. Uh, so that's that was a major improvement over the known results. Uh, but it's not that our work is completely useless now. Um, so there are still uh, simple classes of graphs where our results, uh, combined with some of the recent results, are the state of the art. So. Uh, Take a spanning, take take some connected graph, look at its spanning tree, and see if its degree is constant. Uh, and then our results combined with this result tells you the best bound that we know so far on uh, the circuit depth to form designs. Uh, and for some common sense uh, spanning tree graphs, which are not too deep and have some constant bounded degree, um, our results combined with the previous. Uh, the new results also are state of the art for those kind of things. 
So takeaway is random quantum circuits on fairly general classes of graphs. In fact, almost all connected graphs uh, give us uh, unitary designs in short depth, poly and depth. Um, uh, this result supports quantum advantage experiments in terms of random circuit sampling on arbitrary geometries. Um, we can show complexity growth uh, on, again, any arbitrary uh, connected uh, random quantum circuit. Um, and for certain specific models, which are not random quantum circuits in the sense I define them, we can actually do better than poly independence. We can get log independence, which is the content of the new results. But what remains open is if you just pick two qubits at random from your geometry, you and you pick a high random two qubit gate, and you compose a circuit uh, in this manner, is it? We don't even know if so far with all these results over uh, eight months or so, we we still don't have a clear answer if the complete graph architecture, or we don't, we can't, we couldn't, uh, we have not been able to prove that uh, random circuits on a complete graph gives you designs faster than that on 1D graphs. So that's still open. Only in very contrived examples do we get anything, uh, any improvement on this result. But for the simplest case of random quantum circuits, we still don't have these results. So that I leave as the open question. And thank you for your attention. Any question? Hi, thank you for the talk. So I have just one naive question. So is it interesting to look at uh, random unitaries generated by random Hamiltonians in this setting or not? That is, uh, I think it has been sort of looked at, so it is interesting. Uh, it has improved, so I, I didn't put it in these slides, uh, but if you look at some of the papers by Chi Fang Chen over the past, I think in February and April, uh, they did consider like uh, random unitaries constructed from random Hamiltonians. And uh, there they are able to show um, uh, by Hamiltonian simulation that you can improve upon the case scaling in some of these bounds. So it has been studied. But if you're saying more like if you want to replace every gate by e to the IHT, I don't think that has been studied. Yeah. Okay. So considering every local unit is generated by random Hamiltonians, mm -hmm. generic ones or yeah. some of random mm -hmm. Hamiltonians can be interesting to look at. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question? Hi, are there uh, lower bounds on the depth that you'd need? Yes, uh, we do have lower bounds. Um, and those are counting argument lower bounds. Mm -hmm. I think the lower bounds are both sublinear and N and T, or N and K. Okay. Um, but again, since there are so many different models of random quantum circuits, I'm not sure if one lower bound holds for the other. For example, in the recent paper with uh, where they improve the scaling of forming designs to log uh, log n, they have to come up with their own sort of lower bound that that is in fact optimal and you can't do better. That's because their model is different from yeah from the ones that we study. But the ones that we study have lower lower bounds were given by Brandau, Harrow, and Hordecky. Yeah. Thanks. Other question. So your upper bound is for random circuit. That's right. And so this means your value is some expectation value over this randomness. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. We are, we are finding expectation. So the channel that we are finding the difference between is like, uh, but here. The, the, the expectation value is sort of like incorporated into the channel definition, and yeah. then we are finding the difference. Yeah, but so if I understand correctly, you calculate some upper bound of circuit depth, uh -huh. and dip, that depth is, uh, depth is just a uh, expectation value over chosen circuit. 
Oh no, uh, the depth is uh, it, depth itself is not the expectation value of anything. It is like a clear number beyond which, if you if you pass that threshold, then for sure uh, you you get this exponential closeness. Also, here you use the uh, operator norm instead of this diagonal norm. Mm -hmm. norm. And how is they are related? Uh, by just a worse, worsening of this factor, mm -hmm. this goes to uh, two. Okay, so your yeah. upper bound also shows some upper bound for this diagonal. Exactly, yes, okay. that's right. Any other question? Okay, so if not, uh, let's answer mm -hmm. speaker.